Welcome to Finance Feeds Podcasts. Finance Feeds is the world's premier interactive forex industry news source, providing the latest insights and current affairs from within the online trading industry worldwide. Enjoy our latest podcast episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 24th episode of the Finance Feeds podcast. My name is Nikolai Isayev. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Finance Feeds. Joining me today is Andrew Lane, who is CEO and founder at Acuity. Andrew, thanks for taking the time to speak with us during your very busy schedule. Thank you very much. Really nice to be joining you. Thanks, likewise. So, Andrew, uh, at Finance Magnet's London Summit next week, you will speak on a panel called This Session Was Not Written by Chad GPT which I think is, is, is a great title for a panel. You and I spoke previously this year about AI and related topics. I'm wondering, has your stance on ChatGPT and artificial intelligence changed overall when it comes to our trading industry? And really, what are the implications for Acuity going forward? Ooh, um, has it changed? I don't think much has changed. I still, you know, it's funny, I was just... Um having a meeting yesterday with one of the largest industry titans in in terms of information that competes with bloomberg and reuters and such and they are doing exactly what i was talking about before which is creating their own language large language models with their own data Mm -hmm. so people who have core data will exploit that in terms of our trading industry i think it's a bit like the explosion of the internet um, 20 years ago at first as a bubble and people like wow i really want to do this or you know and then there's a hype in the share prices of people around this and then it starts settling down. And then a few years later, we start seeing real use of the internet and we'll start seeing real use of ChatGPT. And, and we're already seeing a few things that are improving our lives on a day-to-day basis and not, not just being the brokerage. But I will talk further when we, we talk about news itself about one of my concerns I have about brokerages or anyone that, uh, for that matter who owns a, a technology company getting too far down this rabbit hole and wanting to do too much with it and not focusing on their core business. There's also the element which has been talked a lot about more recently is about the compliance around it. And we're certainly hearing a lot of that. Um, Well, actually, I'm here in New York and I was meeting with one of the largest um, discount brokerages here and talking about regulation around AI and how you use it within uh, the financial industry. Mm -hmm. It it seems to me that, like you said, there's been a lot of, if we could call it hype, right, about specifically about a chat GPT and the the associated company itself. But uh, I I think I agree with you in the in in the sense that there are quite a few companies out there that are actually deciding to go their own way, right? Chat GPT is not the end all be all solution here. A lot of different companies can build their own native language models that suit their specific needs. And it seems to me, reading reading the latest reports in the media, there it seems to me like maybe over the course of the next few years, there'll be a few dominant players in the space who will have language models which will be available to adopt across a very, very wide range of industries, markets, and like you said, provide improvements to our daily lives outside of trading industry and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and no, I agree. I mean, there are a number out there, and I think ChatGPT has got the lead in terms of marketing uh, around its brand. But my data scientists, uh, you know, they, they've used ChatGPT in one model of what we do and something. But they, we're looking at a new project currently, and we, we're very much focused on another model um, uh, rather than ChatGPT. Cool. Interesting. So Acuity continues to onboard new brokers, the most recent being Robo Markets, I think I saw in the news. I think Robo has signed up for the Economic Calendar, Analysis IQ, and Asset IQ. What can you tell us about each of these services that you guys provide? Well, um, each forms part of our new research terminal. They can be taken individually or as part of the research terminal. And they fit into a variety of methods such as MetaTrader. They have some unique data sets within them. And they also are visually very compelling, very different. As a founder of this company, Acuity, one of the founding principles is to design and build things that are different, to shake it up a little bit and allow mm-hmm. people to visualize things in different ways. And well, I mean, since my founding, I, I remember looking at Bloomberg, which hasn't changed, purposely hasn't changed, and thinking how ugly Bloomberg was and thinking the industry as such needs to change. We need better UI and better UX. And so that was a founding principle. And you'll see that in these products. And then the technology behind what we do and how we can deliver this content really is quite amazing in terms of messaging, 
in terms of how we're throwing out ideas and choosing data. We have huge amounts of data and how our machines can elicit interesting data sets and show to the user on the front page, look what's happening in the market on this asset because of this data set. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool. And that's another thing we started off in for a long time ago. And this research time and each part of it really goes to that. There is so much information out there and we use our expertise to find information, interesting information or data points that could activate an idea or to trade or activate someone's thoughts on mm -hmm. something. And we elicit that data from our data and then present it in a really cool uh, way. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that, that usability and like you said, the way that the information is presented or analysis is presented is actually important because uh, me thinking many, many years back, I think it was Investopedia, uh, the economic okay. calendar on Investopedia, I believe, which was very, very popular with so many different traders and people, people within the industry. And I could never really tell, well, why? I mean, you have an economic calendar that's provided by your broker typically on your trading platform. But I still saw a lot of people navigating specifically to just a website on the internet, which has the same type of economic accounts presenting the same information virtually to you, but uh, was always peculiar. Why are people navigating there? And I think you're correct. I mean, it turns out that the way the information is presented, I would venture to guess even things like colors and fonts and all of these things actually uh, have an impact. Is that correct? Yeah. Let's look at it from the nuts and bolts. First of all, you have a broker who's investing huge amounts of money in their website to look beautiful, enticing, and then they, they plonk on a, a, an economic calendar and they look identical across every brokerage. So it doesn't help mm -hmm. you there. Mm -hmm. And then you have an economic calendar which brings you information, which is at the very core of the market. The markets move on economic data, news, and it sets off a whole spiral of information. So it's really core cool that people access this information, but it normally stops there. So you have an economic calendar that says, right, non-farm payrolls come out, coming out, we expect 300 plus, and it's come out at 200 and that's it. So how do we lead on from that? So if that's the fountain of all information in the market from the economic calendar, and you've got a broker who has a beautiful website, you've got to make it better. And you've also got to make it lead somewhere to idea generation. And, and that's where you'll see what you see a lot of information on our calendar, how it brings in information around the event in both alternative and regular data, but also you'll um, start seeing uh, linkages to other ideas such as trade ideas from that data. Mm -hmm. Great, awesome. I think uh, News IQ was the latest product that you guys rolled out. I know that you personally come from a news background, so I wanted to ask, what does News IQ mean to you personally, and how can users make the best of, of this feature? Yeah, so that's where I want to come back to ChatGPT actually on that. Um, mm -hmm. So I come from a news background, and what I see in the, in the market is that news is being poorly displayed and poor, and it's hard to get action from it. And in the beginning, when I used to work for the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones, people used to pay large sums to access that information. And what has happened partially uh, since I, uh, before I left and partially after is that people are saying, well, news is expensive, so I'm going to start working with another provider that uh, can produce news at a really cheap cost from a, a, you know, a room in, I don't know, uh, China or Indonesia or wherever it is, and it's a feed of news and it, it doesn't cost much. Now, that's really interesting because they're regurgitating information from other sources, um, obviously. And within FX, you can do that. With equities, it's a little bit harder because there's thousands and thousands of uh, equities. But what is happening now is it's reached a culmination because you're suddenly getting ChatGPT and there's companies out there who will say, I will create your newsfeed automatically in any language you want that will create information around the market and keep your users happy. Mm -hmm. And that can be done just using ChatGPT and a brokerage in theory, could do it themselves. So we are reaching a point where what we're going to find is that these information providers who are low cost are suddenly going to be overtaken by ChatGPT. Suddenly there's going to be something even more low, co low, co low cost than them. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be left with the big operators of news because ChatGPT has to rely on news from its source 
somewhere, such as you know the Wall Street Journal, the FT. And I think these organizations are going to be pushed more into creating value add content with journalists investigating back to their core. Because at the moment, what I've seen in the market is the Reuters of this world and, and the Dow Jones have been slightly trying to play both sides, like create great journalism on one side, mm -hmm. but also trying to lower the cost of their operations and produce content that competes with these low cost operators. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the way to go on the low cost side. And I think chat GPT is going to destroy that. And so we're going to be left with, roughly speaking, we're going to be left with a, a chat GPT model and content being created by computer models. And then we're going to have to rely on brands such as the Wall Street Journal to bring us really unique content. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. And the, what we've done with Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal is create a new visualization. It's not finished yet. There's a lot more to be done. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do is use data science behind the news to make it much more actionable, to show the sentiment of the news and how it's moving the price. And even looking at, you know, um, in the future, like journalists and other data that we can elicit from the text and see what's moving. You know, is it uh, is this journalist more likely to move the markets than another one, for example? Mm -hmm. And I want to get back to a point where people start relying more on news. Now, in the years I've worked in this market, 15, uh, 20 years and counting, I see brokers, the big brokers investing in news but the small ones moving away from this. And because I would imagine uh, the footfall of reading news or the eyes reading news is getting lesser and lesser. And I think that we have an opportunity there to rediscover the value of news because ultimately price moves on the news and make it much more enticing and engage users in different ways. So for example, using messaging, you know, non-farm payrolls coming out in 10 minutes, Here's the latest analysis from the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Come back into the market and and trade it. Yeah, it's interesting that you br bring up uh, you know Dow Jones, and I'm just recalling a situation that I actually experienced in my previous roles, where it was a debate between two different uh, large news providers, as uh, if we could call them that. And I would say you know one of the implications was obviously cost, right? Like you said, but what we found was with the lower cost actually came a lot of headaches. And what I mean by that is um, the ability to filter information within a news portal to be able to provide your uh, customers with the exact information that they need and not have them have to sort through it. Um, I remember that being a specific, uh, a specific issue for me when I was, uh, when I was handling such things. And I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this goes back to what we had just discussed in terms of acuity, being able to take a massive uh, amount of data and be able to analyze it and present users with specifically the information that they would need to make trading decisions or just be informed of what's going on in the markets based on what their needs and what their interests are. There's two sides. We, we have to make news more valuable. Mm -hmm. And your point to filtering out the news, well, yeah, we, but we also need to break news outside of the, the, uh, the, the trading term and use news to bring people back in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into it, like you're saying. But we also need to make the value of news more visual. So just like, you know, basic thing, like the, the volume of news on Apple is going up. Um, you may want to look at this and here's all the stories around Apple. Mm -hmm. or there's a load of chat talking about um, merging and acquisition towards Apple. If you're interested in mergers and acquisition, here are all the news items talking about M&A at the moment, and these are the companies. We'll have a dashboard that looking is looking at M&A, or, or have a dashboard that looks at corporate earnings, or e ESG from a news perspective, all these kind of things. There's, there's lots to be done with news, and I just think most people are... Uh, just think news is old. And I think that's the opportunity for your acuity to do a little bit more in news. And in that sense, we, you have a founder who comes from a news background who has a, a personal love for news and how it's done and, and, and stuff like that. 
And so I think we fight at acuity against the grain in terms of news, but we also have the trade ideas and technical analysis, which is much more ingrained in the FX industry. Mm -hmm. But you'll see us push on the news more and more because there's more to be, it's the opportunity and it's going against the grain of where everyone else is going. Mm -hmm. I know that Acuity offers several delivery options for its tools, including APIs, obviously MetaTrader 4, MetaTrader 5 integration, plug and play widgets, third party automation services. Is this one of Acuity's core strengths in terms of connectivity and being able to provide the data and information very, very quickly and easily integrated? Yeah, so there's a spectrum of de delivery methods. You have widgets, which are custom a unit that can be delivered and you can edit those widgets to the colors and the fonts and the style and how you uh, and and people vast majority of people do that and then you have on the other end of the spectrum is the api where people can build their own things we also have another third part in our set of what we can offer clients is the personalization and build we will build uh, tools for our clients so we are what I term as a semi SaaS um, company, mm -hmm. 90, 95 percent of our revenue comes from uh, clients who take our data or our widgets, um, but five percent uh, will come from clients who want us to build something unique for them mm -hmm. using our knowledge in UX and UI, our designers and our builders, which is, in my experience, is a lot quicker getting us to build it and a lot cheaper mm -hmm. um, than by the time you've got your team to learn and understand everything there is uh, around that mm -hmm. so yeah there's plenty of delivery mo models but what i find with apis and people building is a, a lot more people who want to integrate apis especially around the mobile experience but there is a lot to know and understand about how to integrate and how to you know we, we've got a whole team that focuses on how to visualize something how to make the uh, people understand the information and so we try and lend our experience, even if people are just taking the API, to help in the design and rollout of that API within their system. Mm -hmm. Wow, very cool. So I know we just talked a little bit about perception of, of, of news as a service and how it's changed uh, over the years. I wanted to ask you what you think are some of the other main trends that you think we'll, we'll experience in the coming uh, in the coming years, given what you're seeing in the markets, what you're seeing in terms of feedback from your customers and what they're doing. You mentioned the fact that in, in some ways people think news has lost its value. Do you think that maybe that's a, a byproduct of things like social trading, copy trading, and, and all of these different other things uh, becoming ever more popular where traders feel like they they don't need to rely on their own analysis or any kind of data. They'll just basically copy someone else's trades and hope for the best. So you, you have a vast majority of the market who find financial markets complicated and they want an easy route uh, to doing something. And we have tools that help people on that. I think in where I am at the moment in New York, people are prepared to take the time to learn about markets a lot more, invest for uh, the long term. Mm -hmm. And I think we've also got to differentiate between investment and trading. There's far more education around that. In terms of trends, I, I think options will uh, are massive here now in, in the US and will um, are growing now in um, in Europe and so for, and Asia. And I think we'll see a growth in that as well, especially as FX is more or uh, CFDs become more regulated. Um, another trend I would like to finish well, talk about as well is around ChatGPT, where we started off. Now, my feeling is a lot of people in the industry will start to think, right, I can simplify what I do, or I get excited by an idea that I can create my own newsfeed, or I can do this, I can do that with ChatGPT. And this comes about very often with founders who say, right, well, I've built the most amazing brokerage. I can, you know, I've got a million clients. I can do anything I want. And the simple thing I say to these people is, yeah, sure, you've built a brokerage, but what are you, a technology company or a brokerage? Sure, you could build Acuity, you could build anything, especially now with ChatGPT, but where do you want your staff, your company focused upon? And if there was a trend that was going to come out of ChatGPT, it's making people more resourceful. But I would say going down that rabbit hole, which I spoke about earlier, is that you could find founders who are typically inquisitive people thinking, right, what can I do with this? And taking them down a rabbit hole that leads them away from their core service to their customers, which is brokerage. And I would be concerned 
um, I would just advise people not just about my company because I, I, I have I have this issue myself is I get confronted by ideas. I could do this. I could do that. Uh, I could build a website that goes direct to consumers, uh, B2C, but I don't want to do that because it takes me away from the core of who I am and what I offer. And as founders, we need to be very careful and thinking about who we are. You had mentioned that you know at the event that you are at and the conversations that you've had, and in overall in general, the U.S. seems to be on on a quicker pace in terms of maybe we could call it financial literacy and traders or investors ability to analyze information and, and make trading decisions. Is that is that the case? Is that what you're feeling and seeing as opposed to you know investors and traders in other jurisdictions and other countries? Yeah, absolutely. I think in in the US you're far more used to investing in your own money, you know, whether it's to if your children's college funds or your pensions and such forth. And so people are much more closer to the markets whereas in in Europe we're much more used to having our state pensions and then also having pensions, private pensions that we forget about, we don't get involved in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so financial literacy is is far less. Mm -hmm. Um and that's the same whether you're in London or Madrid or Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's changing. I mean, in the UK, you see people being forced to take out private pensions now, and I think it's a very slow burner. Mm -hmm. But you will see people take more and more interest in the markets. And in that case, I would say that there's probably still a lot more opportunities in Europe and other regions of the world in terms of financial literacy, or at least to make young people comfortable with analyzing information, looking at the market, studying what's happening, and then making informed trading decisions. I think if you look at the, the big macro trends in Europe is that the uh, state pension is unaffordable mm -hmm. and it's not going to survive uh, in its current form. And especially as we've got demographics which are unfavorable and you know the population is getting older. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, in you know, pension ages are rising all over Europe and in the UK and, and other places, governments are, are incentivizing people to put their own private money into markets so that has to be an opportunity but you know we're talking you know plus 20 years mm -hmm. 20 years mm -hmm. of change here that's going to come through in in that sense europe uh final financial literacy or the the amount of money people are portioned in their wage packet into markets is going to grow mm -hmm. andrew to finish up i know that you travel a lot right now you are in new york can you tell me what your impressions are of New York City as opposed to Barcelona or uh, many other different cities around the world that you visit on a on a yearly basis? Just just kind of just kind of curious. How's New York been treating you? I, I think I should throw that back to you, but I will throw that back to you in a second. But I think London and New York are two cities that stand out in the world because they are sort of like countries in their own right and very impressive, very multicultural and. You know, with with all the politics we 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 see at the moment in all countries, it's uh, these metropolises. I think the American word is are very interesting because they stand out at being so multicultural. And I always say to people when I go to London, London say, oh, no, London has shit food. It's really bad. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the best place in the world to eat because you have so many uh, na you know nations coming together. And the same as in New York. I mean. It, it's my third time here. Mm -hmm. uh, I do enjoy it. This time I put myself deliberately in Chinatown. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, and as for Barcelona, well, you can't do that. That's where I live. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what Great. about you? Uh, well, I mean, I've lived here for over 30 years. So you could say I'm a native. I'm a native New Yorker. I don't live in New York City proper anymore, but um, I'm definitely a, a New Yorker at heart. So I do get homesick if, if I'm away for weeks somewhere else and how's it compared to london somewhere else in the world i mean i've i've heard i've heard the i've heard the comments about the food i think it depends on where you go i think the variety of food and cultures just cultures that you could experience in both cities is definitely is definitely a huge plus these are world centers not just financial but culturally so for me both of these cities are very very familiar i, I feel quite um, maybe not at home, but uh, in a very familiar place when I'm when I'm in the UK as as compared to uh, uh, nice. as, as compared to New York City. Uh, well, Andrew, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to speak with us during such a busy time. 
for, for, for all of us. Wanted to wish you good luck uh, at, at your event here in New York City. Safe travels. Um, I will personally see you next week in London, and hopefully we can continue our conversation at some yeah. point in the future. I hope we can have a pint of warm beer in London. Uh, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, all Andrew. Right, no Thanks, Andrew. All the best. Yeah, see and you. I'll see you in London. Yep. Thanks for listening to our latest Finance Feeds podcast episode. For sponsorship opportunities or to become a guest, please email us at info at financefeeds.com.